John the Baptist appeared preaching in Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. All that time, Jerusalem, all Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the ax lies at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, and his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn in the unquenchable fire. Hello and welcome to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host. We're glad that you can join us. Like a voice crying out in a desert, make straight the path of the Lord. He wore camel hair. He ate locusts. He drank honey. Strange. Very, very strange, to say the least. But, guess what? This is why John was born. You remember? The visitation, when Mary w walked into Elizabeth's house and she said, the moment your voice sounded in my ear, the, the child in my womb leapt for joy, that's John the Baptist. He grew up to be a real stylish guy with camel hair and locust, okay? But from in utero, he was a precursor of the Savior of the world question we got to ask, how does people speak God's presence to us? Is there a certain type of person that can only teach us? You know, it's interesting, I, I just got back from the Philippines and there was a lot of poverty. And, you know, and it, it's not uncommon to see people who live with a piece of visqueen, a few boards, and a piece of rusted tin, and they call that home. What was amazing to me is, and this is right alongside the road, little children, sometimes little flip-flops, sometimes barefoot, a pair of shorts, playing, got a stick, got a ball, got a can, Happy as clams. Happy as clams. You know, I didn't really think that I was going there to let a three-year-old teach me, you know, what joy there can be in nothingness when you have joy in your heart. It's great. It was great. Now, some of the poverty was extreme, and but these kids who, by all accounts, had nothing that we consider minimal. They had joy. They had happiness. 
I think that God writes straight with crooked lines. God doesn't always use the powerful. God doesn't always use the great orators. God uses small people and small situations to teach great lessons. I'll never forget, as a deacon, 38 years ago, I'm assigned to make communion calls in the parish. I go to this house, old Italian lady, oh, Father, come on in, we're so glad to meet you. Uh, mother's blind. I go see this old Italian lady, I mean, and when I tell you she was getting splinters from her rosary, that's how much she had worn it down. I mean, that's what she did. She had this rosary, you know, that she had worn down to nubs. And sitting there, I'm going to sit there, oh, Miss Perino, how are you? I said, I'm Deacon Jeff. She took my hand and she kissed it. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. Here's this lady whose holiness is just way beyond anything I could ever hope for, her prayerfulness, and she's kissing my hand? Tell me what's wrong with this picture. And it's in these simple ways that that voice crying out in the desert, even from some of the strange ones, and even from some of the ones we would never expect, they have a lot to teach us. And that is really the message of John the Baptist. You know, he could have, you know, someone who was really powerful, someone who was a leader, a ruler, an orator. He uses John the Baptist, a strange guy out in the desert, okay? And strange by all accounts. You know, and yet, this is who he uses. And, you know, we have this, this statement out of the mouth of babes, guess what? They're not sophisticated enough to be prudent. They call it as they see it. And a lot of times he's, you know, Shh, shut up, honey, don't say that. Say it, kid. It's the truth. They don't know the difference. They don't know whether it's offensive. Well, how come you're with her? Do, Weren't you with someone else last week? I mean, you know, you're not my grandma. <laughs> you know, all that stuff, okay? They'll say things. And there's a lot of truth in that. And I think that's the first invitation of John the Baptist, is that God presents himself and makes himself known in the ordinary, in the extraordinary, and even sometimes in the strange people God makes himself known. How many times have we found people and boy, if I had to live that life, if I had to carry that cross, I don't know what I would do. Just got a new altar server. I don't know the condition, but he's probably this tall and he's six foot high because his legs go sideways and he's on sticks, and I've never seen that kid that didn't have a huge grin, and now he's serving mass on sticks, and he can do it, and he's smiling. Ain't nothing wrong with him. People are looking at him coming up those steps on sticks. They're the ones who are handicapped, wonder whether he's going to make it up those steps. He's got this joy, you know. You know, this, you know, this kid's never going to play on a ball team and, you know, hopefully pray God he'll walk down the aisle for his wife or walk down the aisle to become a priest. I don't know. But, you know, and it's been this way since birth. And he just goes. This is where God speaks to us. Oh, I'm so upset. I got to have so surgery on my shoulder. Oh, I'm so upset. I've got bad knees. And you see this young kid taking on the world on sticks, okay? and smiling to beat the band. Those are the John the Baptists today. Those are the ordinary people who do extraordinary things with great faith 
great love, and they remind us, they remind us of God's presence. We oftentimes have that idea that, oh, we've lost so much, or we've never had so much. And we see people that we have at least materially or physically, you know, abundantly much more. They have joy, so why do we have attitude? And that's what we have to understand. We have to go through life looking for the John the Baptist who speak God's presence in the world. And they're not the rich, the strong, the eloquent, or the powerful. They're the ordinary who do extraordinary things and do it with great love. You know, just ask yourself, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, how does someone who looks like that become the most glamorous woman in the world six years in a row? God knows she was incredible and powerful, but calling Mother Teresa glamorous, okay, that she wasn't. She was absolutely beautiful, but, you know, her hair and her makeup weren't exactly what people were wearing in those days. Her power came from her soul. Her power came from her ability to do not even ordinary things, very difficult, painful things with extraordinary love. And that really is the story of John the Baptist. That's how John the Baptist, you know, comes proclaiming Christ's presence. And like I said, not in any way, not in any way, the strong and the powerful, but yet, in utero, John the Baptist was the one chosen. And God used him all throughout his life to speak God's presence. Maybe my new altar boy in utero who had these legs that were going to swing sideways for the rest of his life was chosen to teach people how blessed we are and what joy there really is in life if you approach it with joy and not with an attitude. And those are the things that we need to look at. Who, <coughs> excuse me, who is proclaiming the presence of God in our life and making us look at our lives and start to see what God has done and not simply look at what we wish God had done or what God, let's look at what God has given and not focus on what God has taken. And let's look at the grace, not in the wonderful things that we've accomplished, but in the very simple things that we've done with great love, great trust, great faith. That's where we experience the proclamation. Make straight your ways. Make straight the way of the Lord. Proclaim the coming of the kingdom of God. Don't look out there. We've got to look in here. And that's where we're going to find him first. And let's let the John the Baptists who are all around us remind us of where Christ really lives as we prepare to welcome him. We can talk more about this, this return when we come back. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today. And a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need. And also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that would, is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly, we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court. We stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. When John saw many of the Sadducees and Pharisees coming to baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? 
produce good fruit as the evidence of your repentance. And do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Hello and welcome back to Close to Walk. I'm Father By, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. You brood of vipers. As if. Who are you trying to kid? You think you scared, so you're going to cram for your finals at the last minute, come get baptized? Have you been saved? Hi, are you Christian? I'm Christian. And somebody walks up to me and says, are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. You know, if I'm really a Christian, I shouldn't have to advertise it. I really shouldn't have to tell you I'm a Christian. That ought to be kind of obvious by the way that I act, by the way that I talk, by the way that I treat people. And if I got to go around telling you I'm a Christian, then who am I trying to convince, you or me? The other thing is, is, well, I've been saved. God bless you, baby. I'm still working on it. Is salvation a one-shot event? Do we get to that point where we can say, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Listen to what John the Baptist said. You brood of vipers, show evidence of your repentance by your good works. Don't talk it. Do something about it. That's why I don't think we can ever say we're saved. Am I capable of serious mortal sin between now and the time that I die? Yeah, I am. Whether or not you want to admit it, so are you. So are we all. You know, when I worked in prison, there but for the grace of God go I. They had 47% of the men who had one arrest on that record. One bad night drinking, drugging, or some type of domestic quarrel. You got crazy for a minute and you paid for it for the rest of your life. Could that have happened to me? Yeah, it really could have. I mean, I, I'm not bragging, but were there times where I was drunk and stupid? Yeah, growing up? Yeah. Am I just lucky I never made that type of mistake? Yeah. Did I make mistakes? Plenty of them. Just never those. Never those that I had to pay for the rest of my life with it for. We're all capable of great sin. And we're all capable of great virtue. And grace builds upon nature. And God's grace becomes more evident and stronger in our life when we seek the things that are virtuous. And when we start, like John the Baptist said, show me the proof. Show me the evidence. Show me the good works that tell me, you Sadducees and Pharisees, that you're coming here because you want to change. Not just you got a little scared of this, this Christ thing and maybe we're betting on a loser. I want to see whether or not you want to believe. And so when you ask me, are you saved? Baby, I, I, I work on that every day. And if you think because you have said you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and now I can go about, you know, all of us are sinners. And we'll be sinners the day we die. But if I think that salvation event happened, I can marry as many times as I want, I can be as promiscuous as I want. I can be as dishonest as I want. I can be as unfaithful to church and the scriptures and the word of God as I want. I can see church as a convenience and not a conviction in my life, but I'm saved. 
John the Baptist said, you brood of vipers, show me the evidence. Show me your good works. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, then you're changed. You can never be the same again if you allow Christ to enter into your heart. Are you still going to be capable of sin? Absolutely. But you're also going to be capable of great grace and great virtue. That's where the evidence starts to manifest itself. Now, because God is here, I want that virtue. I want that grace. So I do the things that bring them about. And from time to time, I'll slip. Always will. It's called human nature. But slipping is very upsetting to me. Being unfaithful is very upsetting to me. Pleasing God is what I want to do. And that's how I start to answer the question. <coughs> Excuse me. I do that when I yell. That's how I start to answer the question, are you saved? I start to work on that salvation. And that's a daily event, that salvation. And the understanding of this, and of course John the Baptist, the, the precursor of the coming, the in utero proclaimer of who Christ was, we talk about the coming of the Savior. Uh, it's Advent. It's that time that we celebrate, we celebrate Christ coming into the world. And that invitation to bring Christ to come into the world is something that every baptized believer bears responsibility for. I was listening to a, a, a talk one time. It was a priest retreat. And the retreat director said, you know, he said, I, I, I want you to, to do this one time. Go to someone's deathbed and say, excuse me, I'm Father so-and-so. Christ wanted to be here himself, but he sent me instead. He said, then you'll start to understand what it means to be alter Christus. What it means to be here, that you're called to be Christ to that person at that moment to prepare them to one day see the face of God. So think about that. And that's what your priesthood means. When we talk about the salvation event, I think there are a lot of people that need to hear, Jesus is coming at Christmas. He wanted to make sure that you knew it. So I wanted to bring him to you myself. Wow, what would that look like? What would that be? If you were to tell, and look, everybody listening to this program takes one person and says, Jesus is coming, and I wanted to make sure that you got to meet him. Therefore, what would you do? How would you become Jesus' presence? Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us, how would you come in his place and let that person know that Jesus truly has come to him for Christmas? He wasn't born in a manger. He's right here. He's come back. What am I going to do to bring Christ to this person? Well, I'll write a check and put it in one of those red buckets. Bomb, thanks for playing. Wrong answer. You know, yeah. You, you, you got a little extra cash, you can help people who help others, that's fine. That's not bringing Christ, that's bringing your checkbook. What are you going to do to become Emmanuel? A name which means God is with us. And if you ever really tried it, maybe for the first time in your life, you might understand the real meaning of Christmas and why we celebrate it every year. You know, it's, it's just amazing. And uh, 
when I was uh, back in college, that was the Vietnam War days, okay? And Simon and Garfunkel had a song out, and it was called uh, Silent Night to 7 O'Clock News. And it starts out this beautiful rendition. Silent night, holy. And as you're singing through it, now all of a sudden the 6 O'Clock News comes on, and Vietnam was gone, and there was an air raid in Phnom Penh, and these many people got killed, and this many people that. And it's just the contrast, the contrast of what we're singing for and then what's going on in the world. And how do we do that? But it always amazed me. We would have a truce for Christmas. December 24th, I'm trying to kill you. Oh, Jesus' birthday. We're made in his image and likeness. We sit down and eat K-ration turkey and sit in our foxhole for 24 hours, catch a little nap. Okay, midnight, we can kill each other again. Yeah, you know, I, it's always my question. God, you stop war for a day. How come you don't know how to stop it? That's because not enough people think that they have the ability to bring Christ, to become that person of Christ and bring him into the world and make a difference in people's lives and make a difference in people's worlds. If you think about it, December 25th is 24 hours. Not 26, not 29, just like every other day of the year. Why is it so special? Why does even McDonald's close for December 25th? The only day out of the year. We've decided that this event is worth watching, worth stopping for, worth observing, worth changing our hearts for. We stop a war for a day? We change our hearts for a day? How come we can't stop the war? How come we can't change our hearts? How come we can't decide that we're gonna bring Christ's presence into the world and make him stay and not let him just be a visitor? That's a choice we have to make. That's what we're preparing for. And I hope that's what you're ready for. Thank you for being with us. May each day bring you closer in your walk with the Lord. God bless you. Mm -hmm.